I'm Megan Edwards of Focus Communications, and today we're getting the latest from Allura Resources, which trades on the TSXV exchange under the symbol ELO. And joining me today is Allura's Executive VP of Exploration, Dr. Bill Pearson. Bill, thank you so much for coming on the show today. How are you doing? Just doing great. Good to be back uh, here and uh, with you, Megan, and giving another update. As your your listeners may recall, we did a really extensive podcast in our September uh, 20th uh, release, which uh, was uh, we were pleased was very well received. And, and today we put out another press release on Tuesday this week, which really shows how we're continuing to move this exciting uh, story forward. So before we get to that, um, for those new to the story, could you provide us a quick overview of Aloro and the world-class ISCA, ISCA polymetallic project located in Bolivia? Absolutely, absolutely. Well, let me move on to a couple of slides here, and I can give uh, listeners just a, a, a little bit of an overview here. On this, our slide here, our opening slide here, you can see the Iska Iska Mountain, beautiful uh, mountain, uh, goes up to about 4,400 uh, meters in, in uh, southern uh, Bolivia. Uh, the usual cautionary statement about forward-looking statements. And here's a geological map of Iska Iska. So we're basically in this large caldera complex. Uh, it's Miocene age, about 15 million years ago. And you can see from the scale here, two kilometers, two and a half, it's quite a large structure. The actual main caldera itself is about 1.6 by 1.8 meters. Um, and you'll see in here, we have a number of breccia pipes. Uh, we've been especially focused on the Santa Barbara area, but there is mineralization all through. You see this green here, this is all day site. These are day site uh, domes. So what you've had here is you had a giant stratovolcano. When the magma that formed that stratovolcano was exhausted, it collapsed and it forms a caldera. That's pretty standard in volcanic complex. And then what happens is the geological forces from the, uh, the, the subducting plates there under the Andes, the pressure builds up again, the magma changer builds up, and you get a second stage of volcanism, which leads you to form these big breccia pipes and these dacitic domes. And accompanying this is a tremendous stage of epithermal mineralization. The, the intrusion that's driving this, uh, which is deeper down, that's where your tin comes from. And, and Bolivia is very, one of those unusual places in the globe where you get tin. Tin normally forms as a high temperature mineral at a great depth. The, the, the crust in Bolivia is about 80 kilometers thick. Uh, so you've got this massive system that's formed this huge epithermal system higher up and then deeper down. Uh, we believe there's a very, very large tin porphyry. Uh, you can see our definition drilling uh, target area. We've you know talked about our goal of outlining a uh, inaugural mineral resource estimate. Uh, we've been pushing that uh, date back somewhat. Uh, and the reason is we keep extending this zone. In fact, this map here, uh, you can see the red dot now. This red outline actually goes all the way down to Porco now because we've, as, as we'll show you in the uh, recent results and we discussed in uh, our uh, September 20th call, uh, we've actually pushed this right across the uh, the valley and we've outlined this high grade feeder zone that extends more or less from uh, the middle of uh, Santa Barbara here, um, essentially all the way across down here. Uh, it's over two kilometers straight length. It's it's amazing. And uh, that's an important point with respect to the press release we just put out on 
Aloro announced uh, multiple new intersections from the high grade feeder zone at the Santa Barbara target area at Visca Isca. Could you provide us with a bit of a recap on the results and perhaps discuss the on strike extension of the high grade feeder zone at Santa Barbara? Yeah, absolutely. Happy to. So this is an image, a drone image of the caldera. You can see the circular shape. There's the Santa Barbara uh, pipe up in the top there. And you can see this valley. So essentially this uh, zone we're talking about goes all the way down the valley like this. Sorry, my drawing isn't too good, but um, <laughs> we've been, our, our diamond drilling along with our geophysics tells us this thing is just going down the valley like a freight train. That's obviously very, very significant for the potential economics here because down the valley is a perfect place for, for a, an open pit. And um, that's one of the exciting developments that we uh, outlined that picture in quite a bit of detail in our September 20th release. And now our, our, our more recent result we just put out this week here, um, our whole third DSV 36 here, uh, we had multiple intersections, including 108 gram silver column with silver, uh, very strong in zinc plus lead over 111 meters in this high grade feeder zone. Uh, and you can see in terms of the, uh, that's just one of many, you can see that that 111 meter intersection has some very, very nice high grade parts here. Um, you know, 180 over 24, 197 grams of equivalent over uh, almost 12 meters, 211 over six. So what you have is this very, very wide mineralized zone um, with a lot of high grade, but that's not the only intersection in this hole. You can see we've got intersections over 78 meters, 55 meters, 22 meters, another one 78 meters. So when you go down to overall in this hole, 52% of this hole contains reportable intersections, averaging about 112 gram silver cone, which is really an extraordinary uh, hit rate. Um, and, you know, this hole is uh, 935 meters long. So you're looking at 50% of that is about 460, 470 meters. Um, so you can see that this thing is absolutely huge. But more importantly, from my point of view, uh, is this, this yellow circle here, that's hole DSB 36. Now that hole is about uh, 400 meters south of our drilling of the uh, Santa Barbara Adit. We've actually took that drilling off this map. We've, we've had so many drill holes on there, it gets very um, confusing. But the other problem is when you're looking at this map, uh, the strike length is, is uh, you know, we're talking over two kilometers from this high grade zone all the way down to the um, to the southern part of the uh, valley. So in this release, we've now pushed this strike length out to an additional 400 meters. Our geophysics indicates that it likely goes right across and I'm quite confident as we, um, as we move on. Uh, and you can see where the dashed lines are here. Um, and you can also see the drilling holes uh, that we've done and, and we have a whole bunch in progress in these yellow boxes here. Uh, our intent is to get right across the valley and show that, yes, indeed, this high grade feeder goes uh, uh, right across. So this is another important piece in the puzzle that's telling you our geophysical and geological interpretation are bang on. Um, right. Clearly we'll have more results from these holes. The other important thing that we, uh, announced, uh, you know, people have been asking me, well, why are you pushing the MRE off? Well, the reality is when you define a resource, and I've done lots of them over my career, you normally define the full extent of the mineralized zone, and then you do a resource. Well, 
we have an interesting problem at Eskaska because we haven't defined the limits of this, this amazing zone yet. For, from a corporate point of view, uh, it was very important for to figure out, okay, where do we draw the line on our inaugural resource that basically will be a progress report? And uh, I just came back from Bolivia, spent uh, a good week with our team there. And, and as we announced in this press release, come up with a, uh, a program about 6,000 more meters, which we expect to finish in mid to latter part of November, which will basically uh, drill out. And you can see the proposed holes all, all around here, basically this whole bunch of holes here. And they will complete this section out to probably, you know, around this area. So that'll pretty well bring it over to the edge of the edge of the caldera. There's there's certainly more drilling ultimately that needs to be done to fill things in, um, but we feel it's very important and timely um, to do a resource now. Now the other important thing that's really critical is in any mining property, if you can start off a, a potential mine in an open pit, that's obviously a huge advantage. Um, in our S September 20th release, notice that um, whole uh, that we had a hole with very high silver. Um, it looks like we have potential in the center here for a higher grade silver zone. But more importantly, um, we'll have a lot more potential open pitable ore. If we can pull this out down to towards the southern edge of the uh, caldera, which we we believe we will, our geophysics says that's the case. Um, that has a huge impact on, on uh, the potential resorts. Let's talk about some future growth. As you seem to be growing the footprint of this deposit with each news release, in terms of strength and depth extent, where does Iska Iska end? Well, right now, I don't know. Uh, if you look at our model right now, our, our leapfrog model, uh, it's actually down to 810 meters right now, which is uh, quite a remarkable uh, depth. Uh, you, you know, you're looking at a strike length potentially as much as two kilometers in a width that's five or 600 meters uh, wide. Um, essentially, you can think of Iska Iska as two potential major deposits. Clearly, we're very well advanced in outlining the epithermal silver zinc lead and tin deposit, uh, particularly the high grade area, which goes from our Santa Barbara Hill all the way down here and likely will go to the southern edge of this caldera. That's target number one, and it's big. But tar the big target is number two, which is the likely tin porphyry that drove all this thing. And we keep hitting the edge of this tin porphyry in our deeper holes. Uh, we had a, a, a hole DSB 33 that had a very high grade tin intersection, uh, about 3% tin over nine meters. Um, and that was on the edge near the central breccia. That's very likely part of the deeper tin. We have a number of our thousand meter holes uh, as we go down and get deeper, suddenly tin pops up. Uh, and our geophysics, uh, particularly the magnetics, which the inversion model gets us down fairly deep, uh, clearly shows us that th there's a high likelihood as tin porphyry. So you might ask, okay, how do I know that? Well, the tin forms deep and the principal association uh, with the tin is tourmaline alteration, but more importantly, the key sulfide with the tin is pyrotite. Um, now, most of your listeners may not be aware, but pyrotite is the most conductive sulfide mineral by a mile. Uh, it's about a thousand times more conductive than pyrotite or galena or any of the others. It also is magnetic. There's only two magnetic minerals, magnetite being the principal one, but 
we're in a high sulfidation system. We obviously don't have magnetite, but we have pyrotite. So the magnetic survey picks this up. And the other thing that happens is when we do the borehole IP uh, and we do both downhole and crosshole, uh, as you get deeper down, guess what? Near the bottom of the hole, the conductivity goes through the roof. So what do I mean by conductivity? Well, when you when you look at the electrical properties of a rock, uh, when people are talking about a conductor, what it means is that when you shoot a current into that rock, it just goes choom, right through because it's highly conductive. Now, if that rock had disseminated material in where the sulfides are not connected, then you would end up with what's called a chargeability anomaly. So you can think of all those little sulfides as like little batteries. And, and the, when the electric current comes in, the, the sulfides grab the current, and we're talking milliseconds here, that's where you get the chargeability effect. But what we're seeing deep down is the chargeability drops right off. And the reason is it's highly conductive. So if you have a, a, some sulfides in there, especially pyrotite, and that are connected uh, with the stock work and whatever, the current just goes zooming through. So we get a big conductor down at the bottom there. We have a, a our magnetic model gets us deeper down and we haven't drilled down there yet, but we keep catching the edge of this thing. And there's no doubt in my mind that there's a, a, a big potential uh, porphyry tin deposit down there. So ISKISK is amazing because we have this massive target that we are going to do a, a mineral resource. You can look at the dimensions. It's obviously going to be uh, substantive. I, I'm certainly not going to speculate on numbers, but um, it's fairly easy to play around with volumes and figure what percentage. But there's also that second target, big target down there um, that we are going to obviously uh, look at uh, exploring and developing, uh, you know, as we uh, as we go forward. So it's exciting. Uh, very, uh, very exciting times here. Now, we appreciate you coming on to give us an update today, Bill. Have a great day, and we will definitely have you back on again soon. Always a pleasure. Look forward to it. Thanks again.